Hi, everybody, and welcome to U.S. Farm Report. My special guest this week, Mr. Chris Walker, national treasurer of the National Farmers Organization. And no stranger to U.S. Farm Report, Mr. John Oster, assistant to the director in NFO's grain department. We'll also be looking at some interviews that were made by our U.S. Farm Report crew at a recent visit in Salina, Kansas, to the eighth annual NFO convention of the Sunflower State. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you on our show today. This is your first time, and I hope that you can survive it. John has Bill. many times, and he's still in good health. I'm real glad to be with you today, Bill. Our pleasure, indeed. You weren't out at Salina, John, were you? Today? No, I wasn't able to make convention. it. Convention. No. A real great convention. We were there and covered it, as you know. Chris, you did an excellent job of, uh, of seeing that everything went along well, and uh, it, it was quite, quite an accomplishment. A lot of work goes into a convention behind the scenes, doesn't it? Well, there certainly is, Bill. Uh, the uh, uh, work of about uh, three directors and five uh, district represent um, state chairman of the different districts mm -hmm. Uh, working together with our legislative representative, our alternate director, and also our public uh, um, publicity uh, director. Uh, we held meetings uh, starting in April, planning toward this convention. And uh, a lot of uh, credit goes to all of the fine help that we had besides more than 50 elected uh, representatives from the different uh, districts who conducted the convention and helped to make it work. Well, this was a, a certainly a, a successful convention for you, Chris. You were re-elected president of NFO in the state of Kansas, and it's my understanding that this is the fifth time that you have had that particular honor bestowed upon you, and you're to be congratulated. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, I'm real happy to serve the people of Kansas uh, as representative of the NFO. You know, uh, John, I like... Uh, Chris's title here at National Headquarters, he's the man with the purse strings, isn't he? He's the man with the money. So I think we should treat him especially nice, don't you? We do. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> Chris, I'm not going to ask you to talk about your duties here. We know what a national treasure is and what he does. But how in the world do you get away to take care of your duties as state president in Kansas? Well, Bill, we have uh, our uh, watch lines here and in the evening, uh, they aren't used so much, mm -hmm. and so I'm able to stay in contact with my Kansas people uh, through our watch lines, and also I'm back in Kansas yeah. uh, every once in a while on weekends. How, how often do you meet back there, Chris? We meet quarterly uh, as a state board, uh, about every three months. Uh -huh. uh, we have to make our plans for uh, not only the convention, but we have a uh, fair booth, which we conduct. We also keep up on legislation pertaining to farming in uh, the Kansas legislature. Mm -hmm. We have a special representative, Alice Kitchen, who uh, spends much time in our Kansas legislature. John, as you know, I'm sure, Kansas is a great grain state, so your department certainly has an interest there, and I'm going to be talking with you a little bit later about some of the developments in Kansas in grain, some of them good, some of them not so good. Uh, Kansas not only is a grain producing state, but I would say perhaps of all the states, it's the most diversified agriculturally. Chris, would you agree to that? I certainly would, Bill. Uh, we uh, produce about uh, a little of everything in Kansas, uh, uh, practically all of the grains and, of course, livestock. And uh, we have uh, irrigation in Kansas, and uh, so it's a very diversified state. Mm -hmm. Now, you come from north of Topeka. I come from Emporia. <laughs> We're practically neighbors as Kansans. Emporia, of course, is now famous for the great blue stem area, the great grazing land, and uh, has become, I think, uh, quite an influential place uh, in terms of feeder cattle. There are a lot of feedlots there, as you know. Yes. Well, um, this year we have uh, moved uh, probably more than three times as many uh, feeder cattle through our marketing uh, this year and what we did last year, mm -hmm. and uh, it has shown a real effect on the price also. Well, that's good. That says a little of the progress of NFO in our state. Chris, what other successes can you think of? Well, of course, there have been uh, some, uh, quite a bit of bargaining on uh, white corn. Uh, we have uh, supplied contracts with Milo and uh, 
uh, some on wheat and uh, other commodities which definitely have had uh, bearing on the price. Mm -hmm. Chris, as president of NFO in Kansas, presiding over the convention, I'm sure you were aware of the fact that our U.S. Farm Report crew was there covering the convention. We were in Memorial Hall. We were later that evening at the banquet session out at the 4-H building. And in the afternoon, I had the pleasure of interviewing some of your fine Kansas delegates to the convention. Why don't you and John join me now, and let's watch these interviews. Herschel Weber farms 1,300 acres in Haskell County, Kansas. The county seat, I guess, of uh, your town, Herschel, is sublet, isn't it? This is correct. Now, you are president of Haskell County NFO. This is right, sir. Let's talk about your farming operation, uh, Herschel. All right. uh, what do you grow on your land? Uh, wheat, and mostly corn, and some soybeans. Uh, sugar beets in the past, but not at the present time. Uh -huh. How does uh, your land treat sugar beets? Do you, do you get a, a pretty good beet out of the land? Yes, we get a, a good beet. Uh, I, in fact, had the first acreage of sugar beets in Haskell County back in 1956, but I don't know. To me, uh, beets have problems 12 months out of the year, <laughs> and uh, uh, cattle, and uh, uh, putting up silage, and picking your, harvesting your crops. Right. I had to cut somewhere, so beets was the first to go. How's the corn looking? Real good. You haven't had any blight in your area? No, sir, we haven't had any blight in our area, to my knowledge. Yes. Well, it looks like we might have a little better price this year. Well, hopefully so, uh, with God working for us and <laughs> NFO help. Right, yes. right. Well, that's not a bad combination, is it? No, sir, it is. But uh, the time has come that we have to have more than efficiency out of our operation. We've got to be able to make a profit. And the only way that we can make a profit is to uh, have favorable marketing. The only way we can have favorable marketing is for farmers, instead of competing one with another, to join together, blocking their production, and selling it NFO way. Uh, I feel very strongly about this, and I think that it's time that uh, our universities, not only in Kansas, but throughout the nation, wake up to the fact that perhaps they should uh, preach and teach a little more to the farmer in how to better market their product, whatever it may be, their commodity, to their better advantage, of course, for more, more profit. Because it's obvious that if the farmer uh, can make a profit, Everyone up and down the street is going to make a profit. The machinery people are going to make a profit. Uh, it just would create a better economic situation in the whole United States, in my opinion. Les Rockers is third district president of the National Farmers Organization. In partnership with his brother, he farms around 2,300 acres in Anderson County near the town of Garnett. Garnett, which is a familiar place to me, you know. <laughs> I uh, I came from Emporia, Les, so oh, I know yeah. the Garnett, Iola, Ottawa area mm -hmm. pretty well. And of course, you're now famous down there for the annual race. Well, we was famous <laughs> for the annual race. <laughs> is that a is that a thing of the past now? I think it was. Yeah. They ruled the track unsafe, and uh, well, the town just couldn't afford the kind of money right. that they wanted to bring up the safety standards. Yeah. Tell us about uh, your operation with your brother, Les. Is it diversified farming? Yes, uh, I would have to say we're uh, probably very diversified. We uh, feed hogs. We don't raise any, mm -hmm. but we'll feed out in the neighborhood of uh, 500 head hogs a year and also feed steers. We have a small cow herd, kind of a cleanup herd. Oh. And general farming, we farm uh, raise corn and soybeans and milo, mostly feed grains, or I guess really it'd be a livestock yeah. program. What about uh, your marketing? Do you sell your livestock through NFO? Yes. Yes, our uh, fat cattle go through the marketing arrangements at uh, St. Joe, Missouri, Dugdale Packing Company on a grade and yield basis. And our hogs go through the collection point at Osage City, Kansas. Yes. What kind of a crop year have you had? Poor. What's been the cause of it? Lack of moisture? Dry weather. Too much rain, too much mm -hmm. dry, too much rain. Mm -hmm. 
That'll do it every that's time. That's the hard system it? to beat. Yes, indeed. <laughs> what about uh, prices to you and your brother? Do you feel that uh, your affiliation and membership with NFO has uh, really made some difference dollar-wise to you? Well, I feel it has. Uh, maybe I can't prove that point, but uh, on the other hand, the uh, farmer that has never joined NFO can't prove that we haven't helped them improve prices. Mm -hmm. They're not good, but we don't know what they'd be without NFO. What do you think in general is the farming outlook, Les? Well, I'd have to say it looks awful bleak right now. Really, I can't afford to quit farming. I don't know what a young guy would want to get into it for. Do you have uh, sons? I have three sons. Do you think they'll stay on the farm, or do you think they'll find it bleak and uh, seek their careers Well, out? I hope. My oldest boy is in the eighth grade, and I hope by the time that he goes through school, farming will be so that he can farm. How are we going to get to that point, Les? That's a big question. <laughs> I, uh, well, I think... Uh, there's too much uh, difference. We have men in the city working for $10 an hour with their dinner bucket invested. We're working out here with a $150,000 investment for what's the national average, 60, 75 cents an hour. And you and I, I earn 50 cents an hour, you earn $10, this other gentleman working for $2, we just can't all compete. Well, it's pretty difficult because we all have then to buy the same that commodities is right. to live. We and, pay the uh, same prices for them, don't we? I can't figure it out myself, but some way uh, they seem to feel like that uh, if food is cheap enough, it'll solve everything. <laughs> well, it hasn't. No, it hasn't. Bacon's just as high as it was when hogs was 30 cents. Now, like today, they was, what, 18, 19? We need price. And Right. Evidently, uh, we've, uh, the banks have uh, gotten us so big, they preached big, we got big, you had to, it helped. Now they've got an individual farmer so big they can't loan him enough money to, farm, to operate on, so what are you going to do? There's, there's no substitute for price. Well, Chris and John, I presume it has to be pretty discouraging to the average farmer today when he stops to think about what the national average says his income is for his labor. Where is it, John? Around 80 cents, something like that, an hour? Depends on what uh, field of production you're in, but this yes. is pretty close to the average, about 80 cents. That's pretty sickening, isn't it, uh, Chris? It certainly is. When we realize the investment that uh, farmers have, uh, $100,000 or more, many of them, and uh, they can only uh, receive 80 cents per hour for income for their labors. It certainly is. Well, I think that uh, there's an answer to the solution to that problem. Wouldn't both of you agree? It certainly sure would. I'm really leading you into this, <laughs> I guess, <laughs> that NFO is striving to do something about uh, farm commodity prices. And uh, maybe this, this is the whole answer, you know? Maybe it really is. Well, yes, Bill, I think so. And. Uh, I believe the attitude of the farmers, uh, particularly our, uh, at our uh, Kansas convention, was the best that I've ever, ever seen it. It seems that they were all unified in their efforts to make NFO work, and they realized that uh, if farmers are going to get a fair price, that it's going to be through NFO, and so we're going to have to work at it. It's a, it's a hard job to get this accomplished. Chris, as a farmer, and I know that you are one, did you have the feeling at one time before becoming affiliated with NFO that you'd rather do it yourself, that you would rather remain independent? Uh, Bill, I think all of us had this feeling. <laughs> and yet, uh, we probably had another feeling that uh, when we got back from taking a load of corn to town and it was below cost of production or a load of hogs or whatever, well, I, I'm sure that uh, many of us have had the feeling that night that I just wish that I was in the position of other people so that I could price that commodity and then uh, we would have a great feeling at this point. Right. John, you're considerably younger than Chris and me. Uh, what about you? Do you recall as a farmer or the days when you said, by golly, I can do it by myself? Surely do, Bill. And I tried it. And it didn't work. It, did it? didn't work. If it had worked, I don't think you'd be here 
today. No, I wouldn't, Bill. I started farming for myself in an era when farm prices, especially in livestock, were at a relatively low level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was, I didn't experience any good prices in livestock till about 1965. Yeah. And of course, they've been relatively good since then up until just recently. And I wonder sometimes now if there isn't an effort being made on parts of the segment of the economy to drive the price of livestock down to stretch out the short corn crop because we're of the opinion now we're going to have about a 3.7 billion bushel corn crop. Well, I recall, John, you and I talked on U.S. Farm Report not too many weeks ago about the corn blight problem. Right. And uh, you said at that time that the government had predicted a certain deficiency in the crop, and you thought that uh, those figures were absolutely wrong, that the deficiency would be three or four times as much as they stated the deficiency would be. How has it turned out? Well, so far, I think our predictions are holding far more accurate than what the government is. The mm -hmm. further the harvest progresses, uh, people who thought they had a relatively good corn crop are winding up with a lot of damaged corn, and the field loss is tremendous. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, this weather, the longer the harvest is delayed, the greater the field loss is going to be. Well, John, in the big corn producing states, they really had double trouble, didn't they? Not only the corn blight, but also they were affected by drought. This was in a lot of the area. Uh, some areas were too wet and then dry later. And it seems like almost all areas that didn't get light got drought. What was the result of all that, John? Well, as a result in the crop maturing approximately 30 days earlier than normal. And when you have a crop that matures 30 days ahead of time and what it normally does, you're not going to have the yield. You can't possibly have the yield when you get with a full-term crop, mm -hmm. and it's going to cut down on test weight, and it's going to cut down on yield. Yeah. Chris, uh, what about corn blight in Kansas? Any trouble with it this year? I don't believe we had much problem with corn blight, uh, Bill. However, harvest of milo and harvest of corn has been about 30 days early this year due to drought. And you know when uh, dry weather causes harvest 30 days early, mm -hmm. it certainly makes inroads into the yield. Yeah. By the way, I think I should mention to our viewers that uh, I prematurely elected you the top man in Kansas for NFO when actually uh, this man is selected from the board by the board, isn't he? That's right, Bill. At the uh, state convention, the directors were nominated. Then we will hold our uh, first uh, reorganizational meeting, which will be sometime in January after the national mm -hmm. convention. And out of this uh, state board, a uh, new state chairman will be elected. Well, I'm what you might call the maker of a president this week. I made you president or chairman, and I'm hoping that that's the way it will really turn out when the directors and, uh, cast their votes, Chris. Thank you, Bill. Let's talk about grain in Kansas, John. Now, you've had some successes, have you not, in Milo in Kansas? Yes, we have, Bill. Uh, we run into a low price area in southwest Kansas where the producers were selling for what we thought 10, 15, 20 cents a hundred in some cases for less than what that Milo really should have brought. So we found outlets for them out of the state. We shipped Milo from that area to Arizona and to California. And we raised the price in that area for, for the other buyers that mm -hmm. were buying there, the uh, local elevators and feedlots. We raised the price up. Well, NFO is, uh, is selling Milo uh, overseas right now, right? Sure are. Well, don't you feel that maybe this is where it lies, the great uh, opportunity in grain? A great deal of it lies in an export market. Yeah. But I don't believe that we should be looking at our export market to determine what the bulk of our feed grain sh should sell for, uh -huh. because a small percent of the feed grain actually goes for export. The bulk of it is used here to make meat, so this is the greatest meat consuming nation in the world. Mm -hmm. And about 90% of our free grain is used for meat production and milk production. And really, we should have a two price system, one here in this country for our domestic use of grain, which would be in line with the rest of the economy. And then if need be, probably a little lesser price to sell into the world market to compete if necessary. But there's a big market out there, Bill, and there's cash customers and they'll pay the price for a lot of this if we simply ask for it. To what port are you shipping mainly right now, uh, John? Well, the Milo goes to Houston, and the beans and the corn are going to New Orleans. Speaking of beans, 
Soybeans are raised in Kansas, Chris. Uh, it's a big crop in Kansas, isn't it? Oh, yes, in the eastern part of the state, uh, we raise a lot of beans. What about uh, marketing successes through NFO in Kansas for beans, John? Well, we have uh, the extruders, which is a process of taking the whole bean, processing it, and turning it into animal feed without extracting the oil. And the people that are using it are uh, the feeders, especially in dairy production, and also in feeding a livestock, have been very well pleased with it. The efficiency of it is so much greater than just the regular soybean mm -hmm. meal. So there's a lot of these small extruders uh, being set up over the country, and we supply a lot of them. And we supply some of them in uh, eastern Kansas, southeastern Kansas, where a lot of the bean production is going. We're also sending some beans out of the Kansas area for export. Well, we couldn't talk about our home state, Chris, without talking wheat. Now, you had a good wheat crop uh, this past year, didn't you? Yes, Bill. What about this business that I learned at the state convention, John, about wheat really, or wheat is wheat, is really not the truth. You just can't say wheat and brand the entire crop in that manner. Would you explain that to me? Well, wheat has a wide variance. And in order to make a real good quality bread or wheat that will meet baking specifications, they have to blend the varieties of wheat. And some crop years will have a high protein wheat and some years a low protein wheat. And really the basis of buying wheat is protein. And prior to the beginning of NF <coughs> excuse me, prior to the beginning of NFO in in Kansas, most of this wheat was bought without any protein premium. And even after the determination that protein had a value, they were buying it on station average. Well, one farmer might take in a load of wheat into the elevator and it would have 14, 15 percent protein. Another man take in wheat that had 11 percent. Well, you blend all this wheat together and you get a station average. Prior to the inception of NFO in the state of Kansas, Bill, wheat was wheat and it was bought mostly on ordinary without any premium being paid to the producer. Now, premium has always been a factor, but the farmer's never gotten paid for it. So, we opened the market first for the farmers or the producers to show them that there could be a premium paid for protein wheat. Mm -hmm. We still have a lot of problems out there where the elevators are under an umbrella of government of state law where they are only obligated to deliver back out to a producer what they call station average, where if I would take in 14 or 15 or Chris would take in 14, 15 percent protein wheat, into the elevator and the station average would happen to be 11 and a half or 12. This is all the elevator operator is obligated to deliver back to Chris. So he could lose two, three, four, five percent in protein, which could amount to 25, 30, 40 cents a bushel. The only solution at this time of that is either to change the law or farm storage. And we are encouraging farm storage all the time in NFO, hoping people will put up the farm storage because in addition to being cheated out of the protein, Sometimes farmers are paying exorbitant rates for handling charges in and out to get their grain into the elevator and back out to where they might market it. It becomes a captive market once yes. it gets in the elevator. Well, NFO, I would say, is contributing to the increase in quality uh, in wheat in Kansas. If, if you can get this premium paid for a higher protein wheat, uh, certainly, Chris, I should think that uh, most Kansas uh, wheat farmers, wheat ranchers, would uh, make an attempt to grow a better grade of wheat, wouldn't they? This is right, and we do pay attention to uh, the higher quality of wheat. Many of us who have uh, stored our wheat on the farm have realized from 15 to 40 cents a bushel mm -hmm. uh, premium because we had protein in our wheat, and certainly this uh, will pay for farm storage in a very short time. Yes, indeed. And speaking of this general lack of farm storage in the Sunflower State, John, you were telling me that uh, this is a real problem with Kansas uh, corn producers right now. Definitely, Bill. We have a situation now in, well, what we would call northeast Kansas, excuse me, northwest Kansas, where there is an irrigated area in there, and they harvest the corn at relatively high moisture, somewhere around 18, 20, 22 percent moisture. And they have no facilities on the farm to dry it, or very few anyway. And as a result, they take it into the local elevator and he dries it down. Now, this corn this fall was being sold as cheap as a dollar and 13 cents a bushel. This is dry basis. So after the moisture discount is taken, I suppose that corn brought me about, about 80 cents. Now, we had a good outlet for that corn in California. Ship it west. 
but because of the lack of facilities to dry the corn and load it on a car and ship it, we weren't able to get that market. Mm -hmm. Somebody else got it. Or if we would have been able to dry the corn down, I can understand taking it out of the field at high moisture, but farmers are going to have to be able to condition this corn themselves so that it can be put on rail car and shipped into the better market and not have to tolerate these extremely low prices. Well, wouldn't both of you agree that on-the-farm storage is a most integral part of NFO's collective bargaining structure? Definitely. Have to have it, Bill. Certainly is, Bill. Without it, it just doesn't work, does it? Not very well. Because how can you hold your grain if you have no place to hold it? Well, it is only a matter of holding it, Bill. It's the additional costs that are added to it many times. And, of course, the blending that you lose in quality and you lose the protection of the protein, as we talked about here earlier. Many factors involved where if there was more farm storage, I think we would find the elevators. The elevators are, at this point, a must, and they're a service, and we would like to use the existing facilities. But until such time as they get in a position where they're willing to charge what we would call a reasonable rate, it makes it very difficult to market grain and get the premium back to the farmer. John, it's been a pleasure having you on our show again this week. Thank you, Bill. It's been a pleasure it's to be here. It's been the most interesting to hear about uh, NFO's Grain Department achievements in the state of Kansas. Chris, congratulations to you again on a fine convention, and thank you so much for making your initial appearance on U.S. Farm Report. Thank you, Bill. It's been a great pleasure. To our be pleasure here. indeed. My special guests this week, in addition to the interviewees you saw, uh, interview at Salina, Kansas, scene of the NFO State Convention. I've been Mr. Chris Walker, who is the national treasurer of the National Farmers Organization, and Mr. John Oster, who is assistant to the director of the Grain Commodity Department at NFO. U.S. Farm Report is seen on this station each week at this same time. Until we meet again, so long, everybody. Mm -hmm.